All right, well, I'd like you, if you would, turn with me in the Bible, in the Word of God, to the book of Acts, in chapter number 13, the book of Acts, chapter 13, Malachi. Is my Bible in the office there? Is my Bible in the office there? No? All right. Run me, run me a Bible back. You can get one from the lobby or whatever. Just bring me a Bible. Acts chapter 13. I must have put it in the office or somewhere. <laughs> Left it in the bathroom. Thanks. Oh, are you gonna, what are you going to get, brother? <laughs> All right. You got another one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I've got my notes here and a lot of the verses, but often I'll go to certain places <laughs> and I need to have a Bible too here. All right. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 44, the Bible says, and the next Sabbath day, Acts 13, verse 44, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Right after the Gospels, we see Jesus ascend into heaven. And praise the Lord, we get all the apostles going out and doing mighty works for God. In Acts 13, 44, it says, In the, the next day, Sabbath day, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and they spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles." For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. And the Jews stirred up with the, uh, the devout and honorable women, and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy, and with the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost this afternoon, but it's an interesting passage to take this from, isn't it? Now, this was a time of uh, persecution, a time when people, these apostles were going out and preaching uh, to a generation that crucified Jesus Christ. They were out preaching to a group of people who was then turning around and blaspheming and hating on them and, and treating them uh, very horribly. And by the way, the spirit of blasphemy is very, very strong in the world today. You have no, to look no farther than the television and Hollywood movies to hear Jesus' name being taken in vain just all over the place. You might even hear it at work as people say the name of Jesus Christ. There's nothing worse. I mean, you know, people have a different category of cursing, profanity, and those types of things. Uh, you know, the, the, these crass words of bodily functions and things. But there's nothing worse than cursing the name of Jesus Christ and with the name of Jesus Christ. But that spirit of blasphemy is still at work in the world today. I saw an advertisement on my phone uh, and just I think it was earlier today, and it, I, I don't know if it was because I was watching a sermon or something, and they're just pushing this to me. But it was something called the. Uh, it was for a movie called the um, uh, something of Clar the Book of Clarence or something. And I was looking at this thing and said, "What is this?" And it's this black Hebrew Israelite. It's this thing with Jay Z, this wicked rapper, and Jay is supposed to be for Jehovah. He's this anti-God, satanic guy that's just basically sold a soul to the devil. And he's pretending to be Jesus, and I don't know what it is, but he's playing Jesus, and he wants the power and the authority and, and the fame of Jesus, but it's wicked, and it has the spirit of blasphemy on it. It's anti-Christ, and we need to be careful uh, that we have nothing to do with that. And then the, as we go into this, I want you just to notice, as they're attacking him, as, as and, and it's, isn't it funny how how uh, people love to talk about our God and our Jesus Christ. They don't attack the Muslims like that. They don't use every other God in this world, but it's our God because he is the one true and living God that they hate. But notice, as they're going through this persecution, trouble, and tribulation in their life, they're filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. They're able to shake it off of them, shake the dust off their feet. They're able to move on and keep serving God. Why? Because they're filled with the Holy Ghost. They're filled with joy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Lord, I pray that as you would prepare us, Lord, today for the days ahead, Lord, that would you please fill us with your spirit. Help us to yield. Help us to obey and in these things in our life. Help us to learn what it means to be filled with the spirit. We, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand today why we should be filled with the Holy Spirit and how, Lord, these great acts that were done in the first century church, they can be done today, Lord, but it has to, we, it has to be done with the power of the Holy Spirit on our life. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The wonderful thing about the filling of the Holy Spirit is it's available for every Christian. Every person that's ever been born again has the Holy Spirit of God sealing them unto the day of redemption, comforting them in the time of trouble, guiding them in all truth, as Jesus said, and convicting us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Praise God for the Holy Spirit's ministry in our life. He doesn't just fill, by the way, those who uh, are mature Christians and have been saved for a long time. I don't have the corner on it. I can be just as not filled as you and just as filled with the Spirit as you. It doesn't have anything to do with a, a priority or, or some sort of uh, authority in a church, but every believer, every Christian, age and stage and uh, maturity can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And as a matter of fact, if it, would, if it, if it wasn't uh, that way, then we would have a problem because the Bible commands all Christians be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit is a command of God. Amen. Paul and Barnabas were out preaching Jesus and the Jews got stirred up and they, they wanted to kick him out. The disciples did exactly as Jesus had taught them over in uh, Matthew chapter 10. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 10. Notice they shook the dust from off their feet. When Jesus sent out the first, the 12, and then the 70, and then he sent out all of us, he sent out his apostles into this world uh, in the Great Commission, but he, I believe he send, sends us into the world as well. He sent them out with authority. He sent them out with power. And he told them, so gave them some instructions. In Matthew chapter 10, uh, Jesus sends out his disciples to the Jews first. And only, and, and then giving them instructions here. Matthew 10, verse 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power. Power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 10, 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Lebius, whose name, uh, surname is Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into the, any city of the Samaritans. I enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of God, heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, Inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into a house, salute it, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever, uh, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear his words, when ye depart out of that city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for, than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Notice here that he, Jesus sent them out. The disciples and uh, the apostles in Acts 13 were doing the same thing. They come to an area and sometimes they were not received. They would be attacked. They'd be ridiculed. They'd be run out of town. And the Bible says they did exactly what God told them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy they left, shaking the, the, the dust off their feet. And we can do the same thing. This world can attach to us. It can get us down and discouraged. But we're just to keep going on serving the Lord. Just keep moving on. You give the gospel to a family member and they don't receive it. You give the gospel to a neighbor and they hate you for it. They, you do you know, good deeds and then the good deeds are 
you know, given evil motives and they lie about you and so forth. We just shake that off and we keep going for God. And notice in verse number one, the Bible says he gave them power. You know, God gives us power as well. Now, I don't believe in miracles today. Obviously, I do believe in miracles, but I don't believe in the sign miracles and tongues and all of the charismatic nonsense. The Lord in the time uh, before the completed scriptures was given to us, today he speaks to us through his son, Jesus. He is the word of God. We have the completed scriptures here from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, the word of God. But during the time when the Bible hadn't been completed yet, God was giving sign miracles. He, Jesus, of course, did those things, and then the apostles had the power there as well. But, but they were to show the power of God and the authority of God. We don't have that, but we do have the ability to preach the gospel to people and have people's sins forgiven. We have not the spiritual gifts of, of those things like the early apostles do, but in Matthew 28, Jesus said this, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The authority to forgive sins, the authority uh, to, to tell people about Jesus and forgiveness and tell people about salvation is to every man. In John 1, 12, it says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We've been given the, the gift of the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts, in our lives. You and I, my friends, if we're saved, we're born again, we have the Holy Spirit of God. And now uh, we have been given authority by God to represent Him and His message. Lo, we've been commanded. It's a commission, a great commission to go and preach the gospel. We have been appointed to what the Bible calls this office, this ministry of re reconciliation, and are now ambassadors for Christ. People will say, oh, Christians have no part in salvation. You know, God does all the saving, and he does. We understand that. But the fact is, we are ambassadors for Christ. We've been appointed to a position by the Holy Spirit. And by the way, this is one of the purpose, the, the first point I wanted to give here is the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Number one is that we would preach the gospel. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, And all things of, are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to, uh, unto us, or to us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation, if you understand that term, means if there are two people estranged, they're at odds, and they reconcile, they're coming back together. A couple that's married might be fighting and have a problem. They separate for a time or have a divorce, and then they reconcile, they come back together. My friends, we were at odds with God. We'd broken His laws, and Jesus came and reconciled us to God. And now we go out into the world and preach that message of reconciliation. And people, anyone who hears it and believes it is reconciled to God and forgiven of every trespass. In relationships, usually uh, where there's two people and there's problems, there's usually uh, two sets of problems. And uh, if we look at somebody reconciling, it usually takes two people saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And they come back together and, and fix the problem. But in this particular case, God is the one. Uh, who's perfect, and we are the ones who've sinned. And so God sent forth His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to make that reconciliation possible. And Jesus, when He left out, He sent every one of His Christians into the world to preach the gospel and tell people about the reconciliation that has been made for their sins, if they'll just believe and trust in Him as their Savior. The Bible says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When we go out soul winning, we represent Christ Jesus. You know, that's why we like to dress up a little bit. That's why we want to look nice. We want to be nice. We want to uh, present ourselves in a, a polite way, in a kind way, in a loving way. 
Because we should take the job serious of representing Christ. But it's not only that. We're supposed to be witnesses when we're at work, when we're at home, when we're uh, going out into the world. When you go to Walmart, you should act like a Christian. You should talk like a Christian. You should be a Christian, dress like a Christian. The job of a, of a Christian, a Holy Spirit-filled Christian, doesn't stop when you leave the church doors. Nay, it just starts when you leave the church doors. Turn over to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. The purpose for being filled with the Spirit is for boldness. It's for boldness. Now, the disciples were facing the same generation of people that killed the Lord Jesus and were out for blood for them. There were some of those that they knew that were contemporary with them right there in the church of Jerusalem that were murdered right there in the streets, uh, namely Stephen, for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were thrown into jail. They were treated and, and beaten and whipped and all kinds of problems. But the Bible says here, we come into one of these stories. And Acts ch chapter 4, it says in verse 1, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus Christ, Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Jesus did rise. Many people saw him, but they were angry. They did not want this thing getting out, they had spread rumors and lies that the body was removed by, uh, uh, by Jesus' disciple. Uh, but this was not the case. He rose from the dead. So they're trying to stamp it out, this message. And there are those who try to stamp it out today. And the, as they laid hands on him, they put uh, him in hold unto the next day. And now, for it was now even tied. Acts 4.4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many uh, as were of the kindreds of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst and asked, by what power or what by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Imagine how powerful this event is, how serious this is. Ye rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he was ma is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Can you imagine being the man to tell these people, we did this in the name of Jesus that you crucified. Now knowing that they could potentially get the angry mob whipped up against you. And it whipped up against them. Take, be, taken before the Roman government and had killed. Verse 11, this is the stone which is set at naught of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other boldness. Listen to this. Then Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby ye must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were an unlearned and ignorant man, and they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They're like, hey, psh, 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 this guy was, these people were with Jesus. Now what right do we have to be nervous about passing out a gospel track? What right do we have not to take up the name of Jesus in our mouth in the midst of this world, at work, with friends, with family? What right do we have? When they're going to stand there with the very people the Sanhedrin, this group that killed Jesus, stand before them boldly. Boldly. Notice the boldness that was given them. The Holy Spirit's there for boldness. And beholding the man which was healed standing with him, they could say nothing against it. Is this what Jesus promised? That he, God would, don't, don't even worry about the words. Don't premeditate the words. I'm not quoting it exact, but he said, God will give you the words. Amen. And when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council and conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. 
I mean, they would. They had no problem lying about it, but they can't deny it because they would basically discredit them. But that is, it is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Now, this threat was not just an empty idle threat, is it? Because, I mean, these are the people, essentially, that killed Jesus. I'm sure some of them were directly involved. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or to teach in the name of Jesus. That day could come in America. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Whoo! Are you above God? <laughs> For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went into their, to their own com company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said uh, unto them. And when they heard that they lift up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all them that is in there, them is. Who by the mouth of the servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Psalms 2. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And for a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast ordained, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Now, let's just pause here for a second. They were under threat. I remember just a few years ago, we're beginning of 2020, they started threatening the country. They, start, they closed down most of the churches in America. They started threatening, hey, we're going to come after churches. I mean, they were finding churches in some parts of the country. They were threatening to arrest people. There were people arrested in, uh, like in Canada and other places around the world. And I'll be honest, I think that COVID thing was manufactured. It was, it was overblown so that they could take power and control and, and have, they have other agendas in, involved in all of that. But here they were facing some real fears. They were facing some real threatenings. And we were too, but we didn't close, praise God. And this was what they prayed for. They prayed for boldness prayed for boldness, that they would speak the word. That's what they prayed for. And I think that's something we should pray for. And I'm just, I just keep mentioning this because, um, you know, they're wanting to lock the country down again. And I cannot believe, as, as much as they have been found out to be a, a liar, they've been found out to be it's been, it's a total fraud, they're going to try it again. They want to try it again. They want to try to shut stuff down, wear the mask. They're flying drones this weekend over New York City. Anybody see that on, on the news? They're flying drones over mass gatherings. Uh, they're looking for mass gatherings because you can't have too many people for Labor Day weekend in, in city, New York City. They're flying drones over people's backyards, and they're going to come in and bust up mass, mass gatherings. It was on the top of the Drudge Report. And I don't agree with the Drudge Report. It was just a news site I looked at. They're, they're, they're very liberal. But you know what? If that comes down to it again and they start attacking, hopefully Americans have a little more sense to go, than to go along with this because I'm not going along with it. Amen. You know, I'm not wearing their mask. I'm not taking their, their dope and all their, their poisonous DNA-altering stuff. Um, you should have muted that, Malachi, because now, now the stream just got, this channel's got nuked now too, I bet. But we're, we're not, I'm not going through it. But, but I'll tell you what, if they start... Like we, they, we thought maybe they were coming after us. They thought, we thought maybe they were going to start attacking churches that didn't close down. And I think that's why most churches actually went along with it. Is, I mean, some of them obviously thought, oh, well, we've got to help people and everything. 
Um, but I think a lot of them were just afraid of the government. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right. But Lord, grant us boldness. Grant us boldness that we may speak the word. You know, we're not going to shut this church down unless like a hurricane hits and we just can't get here. You know, like a blizzard hits and we just can't get here or something. This church is staying open. And, you know, what I said when they tried to close our church down, when they, they did, they announced every church in the country has to, in the state has to close down. I turned the live streams off. Everybody else went live stream. I announced we're going to turn the live streams off and be in person. You know, we're going to be in person only, not live stream only. And that's how I feel about it. And if, if it comes down to it, we have to go underground. God help us that they don't, it doesn't go that way. But um, I'm just saying we're going to meet. And throughout history, by the way, most churches didn't meet in, in buildings with, that are, you know, like in the yellow pages. Most churches in, throughout history have been in somebody's house, in a backyard, in a field somewhere, under a tent, because uh, they were being persecuted. We have it so good by being able to, you know, have like a doing business as and uh, all this stuff and having the government, you know, protect us and all of that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, that's not, we can't, we can't take that for granted. Most of the places in the world, I mean, I've been to underground churches before. I was in one in China. So anyway, we'll go underground before we ever stop meeting. But uh, grant us boldness, grant us boldness to keep, keep the freedoms we do have. Notice what he says here in verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. I mean, they're there in the face of fear, real fear, life-threatening fear. They're threatening. I mean, they said many other threatenings. Like, you better stop. And I don't know what they told them. You know, they might have said, hey, do you remember what we did to Jesus? You know, well, just keep on preaching, buddy. And you know what they did? They said, God, give me boldness. All right. The Holy Spirit's for boldness. When we, uh, we, we should never be silenced for the name of Jesus Christ. We should keep preaching it no matter what. And then the Bible says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. They went out of there and preached the word of God. Let us be bold. Let us be filled with the Spirit. The third thing I want to point out is the purpose of being filled with the Spirit is for His leading us. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, the Bible says. In Acts 13, 50, it says, But the Jews stirred up devout and honor, uh, honorable women and the chief men in the city and raised persecutions against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust off their feet against them. And it came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. The idea of the shaking off of the dust of the feet is similar to our vernacular of just, I'm washing my hands, okay? Moving on to the next house. We're not getting, we don't get bitter, we don't get angry, even however angry they get at us. Uh, you know, because why? Because we are more than conquerors. Amen. We're killed all the day long. We're counted for sheep as a slaughter. But you know what? We are more than conquerors through Christ. Acts chapter 18, if you would look over there. Move to the next house. Don't get bitter. Don't get angry. Just, you know, uh, just move forward and, and keep serving God. We're sad that they didn't, don't receive the message. Acts 18, 1 says, And after these things, Paul, Paul and, uh, departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come uh, from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrote, wrought by, for by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue several, uh, every Sabbath and pers uh, persuaded the Jews and the Greek, Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified unto the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves, and they and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said, Your blood be upon your own head, I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. Paul was pressed in the spirit, meaning he was led or urged by the spirit. My friend, are you are you led by the spirit? You know, if you think this thought, if somebody says you have number one, you have to have tracks nearby you, right? But if if you feel like somebody like like I should give a track to that person. That's probably not your flesh saying that. Who would that be then? That's your whole, the Holy Spirit, right? And, you know, he was pressed in the Spirit, and he goes to them and says it. He preaches what he says. And their reaction was, 
well, blasphemy. But notice this phrase, they opposed themselves. They didn't even realize they were their own worst enemies. By rejecting Jesus Christ, they were sealing their fate, their doom, their, their place in hell. But they didn't even know they were their very worst enemy. The message of eternal salvation was right there, and they are attacking it. Reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. I mean, these people just need to change their mind. But there's, sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's uh, you know, some other emotion. I don't know. This is the way we've always done it. And they refuse to trust Christ as their Savior. And it makes us very sad. We shake the dust off because Jesus told us, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. They hated me, therefore will they hate you. He says, in this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. His reaction was not to, was not to uh, his reaction was to shake the dust off his garment and basically to walk away. He, he said, okay, I, I've done what I can. I've given you the warning. He wasn't, he wasn't angry per se, but sad. And that's how we're supposed to be. We see the Holy Spirit gave them boldness to testify in the, in the face of, of these people who hated Christ. No one wants to take the unpopular position. Peer pressure works on adults just as well as it does teenagers, although it's very powerful in teenagers. But I, I think that's why a lot of people went along with all this you know, COVID stuff, you know, all these masks and everything. Just everybody's doing it. I don't want to be weird or strange. Well, we need to get over that, you know. We're Christians. We're a peculiar people, the Bible says. A lot of people won't dress modestly because they don't want to be seen, or, you know, as a, as a Mormon or, a, uh, you know, or, or some, uh, some other group or something. Like, oh, what, you know, are you a Christian? What, what's, what's the reason that you're dressing modestly or you're dressing nice or, or whatever? Some people don't want to be identified, so they won't carry gospel tracts and hand them to people. The purpose of the Holy Spirit filling is that we would be bold that we would see that that we would be willing to take this unpopular opinion you know people want uh, you know them to be to people to like us it's nice to be liked it's nice to get you know a pat on the back and all of that but the apostles were bold in the face of of opposition and hatred the disciples were filled with joy and with the holy ghost the bible says in acts chapter 13 and so I want to give you this thought as well. The purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is so that we can go through life with joy and the other fruits of the Spirit. I'll turn over to Galatians chapter 5. We're we're you know, they were taking up their cross and they were following the Lord. The Lord you know, walked a path that was very difficult and He asked us to follow Him. I mean, it's, it's tough what Jesus did. He, he denied himself and, you know, he, he of course, uh, did the will of the Father. He gave his life. He, uh, he lived a humble life and, and served other people. And he taught us to do the same. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, you know, and it just, let me just remind you what he says here, that he says the disciples were filled with joy. I mean, they're, they're there being attacked page after page in the book of Acts. But they're filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. The fruit of the, the, the Bible says, but the fruit, verse Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There is no law. By the way, these fruits are not automatic fruits. Okay? There are people out there preaching some of the craziest things I've ever heard. They're, they're, they'll literally say, you're not saved if you don't have the fruits of the Spirit in your life. This is the fruits of being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You say, well, how, how do you prove that, Pastor? What, what, I thought this means that I, I have literally heard people say, you know, my child, you know, made a profession of faith. They prayed and believed on Jesus, you know, but I don't see any fruit. Like a 10-year-old, I don't see any fruit in their life, you know, any of the fruit of the Spirit. That's wicked, okay? Salvation is by faith alone. No works required. You can't prove your 
works or your faith. You cannot prove your faith by your works. I mean, the book of James, I understand what it's saying. We can show forth our faith to the world by our works, but that doesn't make you saved, okay? Because guess what? An unsaved person can show forth, like they can exhibit to the world, and they can even put on the, a sheep's clothing and walk around and, and look at my fruit, you know? Look, I'm so full of love. I'm so full of joy. Wasn't that what the Pharisees were doing? But in, inwardly, they were ravening wolves. In, they were literally whited sepulchers filled with dead men, uh, uh, metaphorically, obviously. Sorry. That's what they were. Is they were basically like, Jesus said, uh, just a tomb with dead men's bones in it, but they're this beautiful sepulcher. So, you know, you can go around, oh, I'm so full of love and joy. You could probably go in a Lutheran church over here. You go in a Catholic church and everybody would say, oh, that priest, oh, look at him. Oh, they're so full of love and joy and peace. Yeah, well, inwardly, they're ravening. They're wicked. They're filled with the devil is what they are. Okay? So we do not prove our salvation by our works. Amen. I, I just want to hit that real quick. Because there are these people out there. Let me just go back for a second here because I, I don't know if I'm making any sense. I want to clear this up. Malachi, can you c cut that off? I don't know what that is. I'm hearing myself preach it myself here. I, I, I don't like that now. Stop that. <laughs> All right. I guess the live stream decided to kick in there. But, but the fruits are not automatic, right? Because look at verse 24. And the, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. People will say, well, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have the fruits of the Spirit, well, you're probably not saved. And they'll use this as a way to kind of manipulate you. Yeah, right. they'll, they'll get up and they'll preach a sermon. Examine yourself. You, know, you might not be saved if you don't have this, all these good fruits in your life. And, and if you want to sin and you have desires to sin in your life, you know, if you still like carnal things in your flesh, you might not be saved and just creating all this muddy gospel, all this confusion, and people are sitting there in their seats like, oh, I wonder if I'm saved. Well, my question is, are you saved? Here's my question. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior? It's really that simple. People should not doubt their salvation. Amen. Okay? Why? Because it's faith alone. Yeah, amen. It's faith alone. Anyway, to be clear, I just want to just touch on this. Now, uh, rabbit trail, I know. Go back to verse 16. Bible says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, you know, what is that? That's being filled with the spirit of God. Now, look, if you're walking in the spirit, you're going to exhibit the fruits of the spirit in your life. But a Christian can absolutely be walking in the flesh. Yeah, man. You can be walking in the flesh all day long. You can you not be thinking one thing about God, one thing about church, and one thing about the Bible, not praying a single prayer, going through your life all day long. And guess what that flesh, if you walk in the flesh, what are you going to exhibit? The fruit of the flesh. Yeah, right. And what is the fruit of the flesh? Well, it's the same fruit that, look, look it's, it's what, you know, what we have always had, the struggles and temptations to sin. And he gives you an example of this. Jump down to verse, oh, verse 17. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for the, and these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Oh, it's a battle every day. Walk in the flesh, do the works of the flesh. You say, I just keep stumbling with sin. I just keep going to the same sin. I keep struggling with that sin. I, keep, I can't control my tongue. I can't control my eyes. I can't control my, my heart. Whatever it is, I can't keep falling into it. Are you walking in the flesh? Or are you walking in the Spirit? The promise is given, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is that, I mean, is that pretty simple? Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a battle every day, folks. And the Holy Spirit's been given to us so that we can have victory and we can have the, the fruits of the Spirit in our life. I was, Brother Frank and I went over and we we're talking to a guy who's, who, whose life was wrecked by alcohol. We were ministering to this guy and I said to him, his wife was leaving him and, his ki and it, taking the kids and all this stuff was going wrong. And I read him this passage and I said, hey, do you, do you feel like alcohol is helping you or hurting you? It's hurt me. I said, would you like to have some love in your life, joy and peace? He goes, oh man. Long-suffering, gentleness, and went through the list with him. And I said, you know what you need to do? We got him saved, first of all. 
And then it was a matter of walking in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Now, the gospel is, si is simple. Put your faith in Jesus Christ alone. Okay? And there's this false doctrine out there that says if you're in major sins, then you're not saved. That's confusion. Amen. That's confusion. The gospel is simple. Faith alone. But they say, well, they'll get up in their sermons. Man, it drives me nuts. Well, you know, 80% of people in independent Baptist churches aren't saved. Anybody heard that before? <laughs> well, I just, you know why? And, and then, you know what they're saying? And then if you really dig down to what, what they're talking about, they'll literally look at somebody that's going to, to an independent Baptist church and they'll say, well, you know what? Those people, they don't read their Bible every day very faithfully. So, yeah, they're not saved. Oh, those people don't go to three services a week. They're not saved. Oh, those people, you know, I, that, that guy only comes on Easter and Christmas. They're not saved. Or, or, you know, well, that person drinks, you know, alcohol once in a while. Now, am I saying any of this? is? I'm not saying it's not sin. And some of these things are sin or whatever. I'm just saying that that doesn't mean that you're not saved. Okay? If you do those things, you know, well, I don't think. And, and I, you know, I would say it's very subjective. And it's very, the Pharisees, you know what they would do? They would look at someone else and, and point out all their flaws because it makes them look better. It's self-righteousness, right? And this, this creates confusion in the minds and hearts of people. But the gospel is so simple. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, <clears throat> but they'll say things like, you know, most of you aren't saved. You know, because we haven't seen any change in your life. No fruit. Where's the fruit in your life? Well, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Remember, it says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that tells me if you're saved, you can walk in the Spirit. And, or, excuse me. You can walk in the flesh. I mean, right? Yeah. If you're saved, you can still walk in the flesh. It's possible, right? Yeah. And they just completely d disregard this truth that when... There's a new man. They'll say, oh, you're an, a, a new creature, and old things are passed away. Yeah, but the old man is still there. Amen. You've got a new man and an old man. Your old man wants to do wrong. The new man wants to do right. You're walking in the flesh. This flesh still lusts and desires the same thing. I can covet. I can lust. I can curse. I can do everything that I could before I got saved. Now I just got two natures. Now I can walk in the flesh or I can walk in the spirit. Before that, it was just flesh. He says the works of the flesh are manifest. Verse 19. Which are these? Adultery. My friend, Christians can commit adultery. Fornication. Christians can commit fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Idolatry. Yes, they have. They have. I mean, good night. We know Solomon saved. We know... Man, many of the Old Testament... You know, there was, there was some major idolatry, even witchcraft. I mean, Saul is in heaven, and he, he went to a witch. Amen. Hatred. We know Christians can hate. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. Can, can Christians commit murder? Yes. <laughs> we got examples of that in the Bible, don't we? Drunkenness. Christians can get drunk. Revelings and the such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that phrase right there confuses people, and, and these, these guys will get up. You know, some of them are false prophets. Others are just confused themselves. I don't know, repeating garbage. But they'll get up and say, See, anybody that does these sins are not saved because they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, just disregard the rest of the chapter then because he says if you walk in the flesh, or if you basically, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, which means if you walk in the flesh, you'll fulfill the lust of the flesh. And these are the things you're going to do. And I have sat there and, with, and counseled and talked to Christians who have just wrecked their lives with sin, just doing all, many of these things. And it's wicked, and I hate to see it, but it destroys their life. They're still saved if they trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Amen. And then these self-righteous preachers get up, and they'll twist these verses. Turn over to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 9, or chapter 6. But, but they'll, they'll say, see, if you have these sins, you're not really saved. 
But this is, this is completely destroying the doctrine of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Because the point is, is that if you are filled with the Spirit, you're going to exhibit not the fornication and the drunkenness and all of these sins. You're going to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering. Now, he says this, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He literally commands at the end of the chapter, If we live in the Spirit, which we do, let us also walk in the Spirit. Because we're not supposed to live like those people. Here is what it's actually saying. When it says, these people don't inherit the kingdom of God. What he's saying is, is that there are unsaved, unwashed, unforgiven, unborn again. Is that a word? People who have not been forgiven of all their sins. That, that's what they are defined by. That's who they are. They're a drunkard. They're this or that. But when you get saved, your sins are forgiven. You're blood washed. And that's not you anymore. And now you have this option. You are born again into God's family. And you don't have to, to give in to those things anymore. And you have the option of following the Holy Spirit to love and joy and peace. You're not considered one of those. But you, can you do those sins? Yes. So what is he saying? These were the sins that defined you before you were saved. Now your sins are forgiven, and you're not defined by those sins. And now you shouldn't go back into those sins. And then these guys will say, oh, well, well you, 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 can't, you can't go back into those sins, but otherwise you're not truly saved. You know? And those of you, 30 to 50% of you who are not, you know, that, that, that have struggles with sins are, are not truly saved. I've heard preaching like this. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Now... Um, <clears throat> know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor or adulterers, or effeminate, nor abusers of them, the, themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Another list is found in uh, Revelation. Um, let's see if you got, you got lots of verses underlined in this, brother. Let's see if you got this verse underlined. Revelation 21.8. I like it. You, I can tell you read your, you read your Bible, brother. All right. You didn't underline this one. You, man, you got 10 verses underlined, and this is not one of them. All right, Revelation 21.8. I'm just picking on you. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, right there is another verse that says, See? Everybody that's a liar and abominable and these different things are going to have their part in the lake with fi uh, burned with fire and brimstone. Now, are you going to tell me that you, you never told a lie since you got saved? Well, this guy said, well, if you truly get born again, you can sin, but you won't commit habitual sin. My friend, look, habitual sin, look, we're, we all sin every day. Amen. It's a habit. It's a bad habit. It's like, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know why the, what, why do the nuns wear habits? I mean, I, you know, like, that's something you want to drop, right? Or get rid of. Best way to, you know, get rid of a habit is to drop it, right? So I guess if it could be a good habit. No, it's a bad habit. I don't know why I'm telling a, that's a silly joke. It's for, it's for flying, yeah. But, you know, what my point is here, look at this. He says, these are, these are things that, that shall not inherit. These people shall not. Well, why is he? All liars shall not, you know, shall have their park in, part in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone. Well, praise God, I'm forgiven for all my lies, even the ones I haven't told or I haven't even told yet. I, I don't set out to tell any lies, but boy, it sure is easy to be a little deceptive here and there or to color things a different way to make ourselves look good or to get out of trouble or something like that. And you know what? We're all, we all have that tendency to sin. That's our flesh, but our spirit is telling us, the, the saved, born again part of us is saying, hey, don't you do that. And I'm, sometimes I listen and sometimes I don't. So, oh no, but neither thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, the original Greek, you know, well, we got the King James English, which is perfect, okay? So if it says something different in your Greek, you know, maybe your Greek lexicon definitions are wrong, all right? Or maybe you don't know Greek and should stay out of the Greek. What does it actually say? 
you know, they'll say, well, here, it says in the Greek, let me say this, they say, they say this, it says in the Greek, oh, you, you, it says in the Greek here, uh, you, can, you could steal something, but it would be a continual doing it, a habitual sin. You could be covetous, you could drink, but, it, you know, habitual drinkers are not going to get into heaven. In the original Greek, in the original Greek. Listen, beware of anybody who says the original Greek. You know, I'm going back. And the, what it really means in the Greek, that stuff is, is bad. Okay? That is not right. That is a way to add to or take away from the Word of God. To change the Word of God from what it says. <clears throat> the Bible is perfect in the English. You can get a dictionary. You can read it and understand it. You don't need an English dictionary. And you don't need the Greek. So what does it actually tell? What is the context of this? Is this saying, is this saying is the false prophets and, and these confused people like to say that, oh, if you commit fornication habitually, you're not really saved and you should examine yourself to see if you're saved or if you commit adultery or any of these other sins, you're not really saved? No, that's not what it says. What is the point of this chapter? Well, it's a letter to the Corinthian church. And he's been dealing with one problem after another. The chapter 5 dealt with a fornicator who was, this guy was literally laying with his father's wife. In chapter 6, he gets to a point where he's dealing with people going to public law, suing one another in the church. Verse 1, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that all, or that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall, be ju that we shall judge angels? How much more things that are, are pertain to this life? If ye, or if then ye have ju uh, judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth the law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, this is not talking about covering up some criminal activity, some abuse, or something like that. Not at all. This would be, you know, a brother suing a brother for like a breach of contract or, you know, a disagreement. You know, maybe they went into business together and then they, they went bad or something. And then they're like, I'm, I'm taking you to court. I'll see you in court, buddy. That kind of thing. And he says, look, just get the least esteemed that's born again in the church there. And they'll, they'll be a better judge than the world. He's actually contrasting the worldly judges here. That's the whole point. To even the least esteemed, the least, uh, you know, the, the, the lowest brother in Temple Baptist Church would be a better judge in the matters of this matter than the, the, the wicked, often reprobate judges of this world. You know, that's what he's saying. And I think it kind of applies to today. A lot of these judges are horrible judges. I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not talking about anybody in particular, particular. You think of who you want to think about when I say that. But it still goes to today. But he said, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourself to be defrauded? He says, you know what? For the cause of Christ, just let it go. It would be better. It, you know, you could take it to the church. The Bible gives us a process. If we have an ought with somebody, we can take, go to them and then go with two or three witnesses. And then we can go, go before the whole church and have the whole church decide on a matter. You can do it that way within the church. But he says, or you could just like say, you know what? I'm going to forgive it, and I'm going to turn the other cheek. I'm going to let it go. That would be an option, right? I mean, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but, you know, I'm sure a few of us have turned the other cheek when it comes to some things that have happened in churches over the years. For the cause of Christ. And then he gets to this. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteousness of the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? This is who you're going to be judged by if you go into the court. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, or adulterers, or effeminate, or abusers of them, themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, 
but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of your God. He's not saying, oh, well, you're not committing these sins habitually. He, as a matter of fact, he's saying like some of you probably, I mean, maybe they are, and that's why they're the least esteemed in the church. <laughs> They're having some problems, maybe, I don't know. Obviously, you're supposed to kick out the fornicators and stuff like that, and the drunkards too. Some of these other ones. But, but the, the bottom line is, if you go before the world, you, you go before the law, you go, go over here to the courthouse and sue somebody in the small claims court, you're going to probably be before the fornicators, the adulterers, and all of them. Okay. And he says, that, that's the point. He's not sitting here saying, you know, okay, all you guys in the room here, if you do these sins, you're not saved. Listen, you're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you sincerely put your faith in Him and trusted in Him, the moment you did, you were born again. Amen. You are His child, and you don't have to doubt that fact. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we can know that we have eternal life. Amen. All this stuff about, oh, or just double check, make sure you're saved, because if you're sinning, you might, you might not be saved and all of that. That is leading to and possibly a false gospel. Amen. Muddy at least. It's a command to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to stop there for today. But Jesus, the Holy Spirit's job is to provide, I mean, you know, the, these fruits of the Spirit in our life. And one of the great reasons to be filled with the Spirit is so that we exhibit these things in our life, that we have them in our life. We need them. Because let me tell you, right, That's there's a saying, if you're not going forward in your Christian life, you're going backwards. And the, way, the reason that's true is because if you're not going forward, that means you're walking in the flesh. If you're not walking in the Spirit, you're walking in the flesh. There's only two options. So we need to walk in the Spirit. And if we'll walk in the Spirit, we'll deny the lust of the flesh. And we'll walk in the Spirit. We'll, we'll have these things begin to develop and, and bring uh, fruit into our life. Love, joy, and peace, and long-suffering. Dear Heavenly Father, simple message I know, uh, Lord, but I, I, I preached it from my heart, and I pray, Lord, that you'd bless it to the souls of those who heard it today. Please minister and help our folks, God, this very week to, to be filled with the Spirit. Help me, God, uh, Lord, to be filled with the Spirit this week. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.